First Timothy chapter 3, please. The first epistle of Paul to Timothy and chapter 3 and the verse 16 down to chapter 4 and verse 6. Take your time and get the place and keep your Bible open. Nice to have you tonight. Ask the Lord to speak to you. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy or controversy, whatever way you pronounce it, great is the mystery or the revelation of godliness. God was manifest in flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. But now, that word now, I understand should be but, according to translations. But the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. That should be demons. There's only one devil. But there are many, many, many demons at large even today. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. I trust you give thanks when you're taking your meal, not only at home, but out in a restaurant or anywhere you are, and don't be ashamed ever to thank God for your food. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, Paul writing to Timothy, Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Just a short prayer, please. Father, we thank thee for the songs we have been singing and the prayer that has gone up and for your word that now has been read. Lord, I come before thee, I am needy. Who is sufficient for these things? I certainly am not, Lord. And I just pray in Jesus' name that your name will be glorified, uplifted, magnified. Men and women will see Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty today. And that you will speak into our hearts and lives in these days. Amen. Whenever the great Oliver Cromwell sat down in the studios of David Levy to have his portrait taken, Cromwell noticed that Levy was studying his face very minutely and very carefully. And he knew what he was thinking because on the face of Cromwell were a number of warts. And without saying anything else, he just looked at the expression on Levy's face. And he made that famous statement, wart and all. Of all the things that I love about this old book, one is that it gives us wart and all. It covers nothing up. There's no fake news of the world here. If this was a biography of some men or women written by another, 
or an autobiography written by oneself. There will be a lot of tinkering, concealing and tweaking done in order to make it more lovable, more laughable and probably more profitable. The truth about every man is only really known to himself and there and some of it by his close family. But God knows all about us in all our hearts. This book, this word of God, that was penned by God, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who cannot lie, who is a very epitome of truth. He's not in the business of covering up, glossing over, or concealing, or currying favor with any man. He tells it as it is. Whether it's King David's shenanigans with Bathsheba, or Abraham's affair with Hagar, or John the Baptist wobbling in the prison, doubting his faith and questioning the Saviour, or Ananias and Sapphira and their lies in the early church. He gives it wart and all. I suggest to you tonight that there's nowhere that the warts and all scenario is on display in the Word of God. And in this last verse of 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, what a mighty verse this is. We go from the mystery of godliness to the mystery of iniquity in one stroke of the pen from one chapter to another. Verse 16, what a mighty, verse 16, what a mighty breath that is. What a mighty breath. And you read that verse and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the glory, in the world and received up into glory. Oh, if only he would have finished there. If only Paul would have put a full stop there at the end of this. But then he goes on. He goes on to uh, say something awful and powerful that we need to know. This would have been a bestseller. This would have been a mighty blessing and encouragement to young Timothy if he had stopped at the end of the chapter. Young Timothy was a struggling pastor in the wicked place of Ephesus. It was a godless, demonic place infested with witchcraft, curious arts, astrology, and demonology, where one man, Acts 19 tells us, in Ephesus was possessed with such a power of demons that he stripped and beat and wounded seven preachers and they had to flee naked. What a verse he comes into this chapter with. And I couldn't emphasize this enough. The Bible, one of the greatest Bible doctrines of Christ, without doubt great is the revelation I want you to look at it again, for I must hammer this point home before we go on to the warts and all. I must hammer it home to you because I can see what the Apostle's doing here. He's trying to encourage young Timothy before he goes on to talk about the latter times and these awful days in which we're living in. He says, he speaks about the incarnation of his body mystery of godliness manifested in the flesh, a justification in the spirit, a duration of angels, the proclamation to the Gentiles, the glorification in heaven and received up into glory. I'm sure that whenever the young Timothy read these verses, that he would have wanted to stay there. I'm sure that he would have wanted to keep meditating as I would want to do and try to just love these 
truths about Christ, I don't think there's any verse where he's exalted so much. I'm sure he'd have loved to stay there just like John, James and John and Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was transfigured before the, when they saw his glory. But they had to come down. And we have got to come down, you know, from the heights at times. They had to come down from the Mount of Transfiguration to the sin-cursed world, to the boy possessed with the demons, frothing at the mouth and throwing himself into the water and the fire and the father distracted. He had to come down, they had to come down to the battles of the world, the flesh and the devil. And we must come down to reality in these days in which we live. In fact, we must come down to reality. We can sing very well on a Sunday night when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. We can sing face to face with Christ my Saviour, face to face. What will it be? We can even sing as we're singing as good as singing as you've ever heard here in this church tonight, the King is coming. But tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning we have to hit our feet upon the ground. Tomorrow morning we have to square our shoulders and face reality. Tomorrow morning we have to face the foe. We have to face the challenges of family, of marriage, of children of health, and God knows what else, and so many other things. We've got to face them. We have got to be real. We've got to be real, my friends, that we're living in dark and evil days. And thank God for the Lord's day. Thank God when we can fellowship. Thank God when we can sing and have a bit of fellowship together. But we must face reality. There's a dark and evil world out there, as you're going to see tonight. Praying with all its evil wickedness against the youth, the young people, the children, our schools, our families. And that verse now, as I've said in chapter 4, but, but, the Spirit speaketh. You see, that speaketh expressly, that means explicitly and vividly. There's few places of any in the Word of God that the Holy Spirit emphasizes something with such urgency, clarity, and authority is here. I want to see how we've come from the doctrine of godliness to the doctrines of demons and one stroke of his pen. The Spirit speaketh expressly, vividly, powerfully in the latter times. Mark the latter times. That's beyond the last days. The word for the last days is that word eschatolis, where we get the word eschatology from, what we're dealing with these nights, the end times, the second coming of the Lord. And if in the last days where we were last week in 2 Timothy 3, if there we were five minutes from midnight, I can tell you with the latter times we're about one minute from midnight and the clock is ticking. See what the verse says. Watch the scriptures. Let the word speak to you tonight. Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly, vividly, powerfully, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Some shall depart from the faith. That means many shall depart. That, more, that word depart is shall depart, deny, and abandon, abandon the faith. And there's no decade, I can tell you, my friend, there's no decade where so many have turned away from the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and the old gospel than the has in this decade that has passed. Jesus, John, Peter, Jude, Daniel, Joel, Zechariah and others all warn, warn us of these last days and they all warn us that false prophets will arise and we'll not be able to identify them unless we're spiritually in touch with God. We will not be able to identify them because Jesus tells us if possible he'll deceive the very elect 
They're telling us these men, and the Lord Jesus emphasizes it several times. And Jude and Peter, as I've said, that there'll be wolves and lions and bears and sheep's clothing, denying the Lord that bought them. But not only turning away themselves, and this is the thing that has gripped me as I prepared this message, not only turning away themselves, and that's bad enough, I tell you it's bad enough when a man or woman that spoke the truth and preached the gospel turn away from the faith. Bad enough when they deny the truth of the blood and of the cross. But when they take others with them, that's the sad thing. And that's what's happening today. They open themselves. And we're dealing here tonight with the doctrines of demons. And if only we could get a look into the world of demonology. If only we, the people of God, could open our eyes to see what's going on in the imps and emissaries of darkness with our children, with our homes, with our schools, with our family, even with ourselves that we don't know. This is a serious verse of Scripture. These are serious six verses. And there's a deal, Paul says, with the latter times the times in which we live in, the doctrine of demonic spirits, seducing spirits, destroying young Christians, young churches, young families, and very society itself. That's their agenda. These demonic imps and emissaries are flat out waging war upon us. Satan knows that his time is short, and this is his final blow. And he's free to do almost what he likes. The demon, demons are free to do almost what they like because there's a sick, dehydrated church with no power. You must hear me tonight. There's a church that has lost her way. There's many Christians more interested in business and money and homes and families and holidays, preachers, than there are in combating the powers of darkness. And facing the enemies and coming to pray. God help us. We have got what we deserve in our land. We have got what we deserve in our government. It's very, very sad. Satan knows that the time is short. And so we start off here. We start off here. He starts off here giving heed to seducing spirits. Seducing spirits seem to be the first arrow out of the, devil's, out of the devil's bow. Now I checked the Oxford Dictionary for this word. And the Oxford Dictionary describes the word in a sexual context. It describes the word, it describes this word very powerfully, seducing, in, re, in regards to luring for lust and enticing in sexual activities. For instance, and surely, surely the apostle, writing away back those millenniums ago, surely the apostle knew, moving by the Holy Spirit, says, I must tell you, he says, Timothy, that if you haven't Christ in his rightful place, if we haven't Christ, if we haven't saturated ourselves in verse 16, then we're going to, it's going to be bad enough, but it's going to be worse. And I don't have to tell you tonight, my friend, that sexuality, pornography, sodomy, transgenderism, same-sex marriage, and the list is endless, is the agenda of the demons above everything else. You know that, you see that, we see that in the past couple of years especially. The damnable wokeism ideology pushed by the LGBT when we're almost afraid to open our mouths. When four-year-old boys can dress as girls and demand their parents that they want to change sex, four-year-olds. 
four-year-old coming into school dressed as a girl with a pink school bag. And if the parent or teacher had opened their gub, they're subject to legal proceedings. Who do you think's behind that? I just heard last night about a teenager in a college in America. And when the teacher came in, he was curled up on the desk and he was licking his feet, his toes. And the teacher said to him, what are you licking your toes for? He says, I'm not licking my toes, I'm licking my paws, I'm a cat. You can put that up if you want to on the internet. And, the, and she complained to the mother, and the mother said, he is a cat, and he's been a cat for years, and he's going to stay at school as a cat. My friend, you ever see anything as ridiculous or how stupid or how evil and how wicked? Times are. What's doing that? That's the doctrine of demons. Doctrine of demons. When men and women, men marry women and women marry men and be married by men who once preached the truth. And in some cases, in same-sex marriages themselves, and ministering communion in churches and giving the sign of the cross to the sodomite wedding, defiling, blaspheming in the name of Jesus. Where does that come from? It comes from the pit of hell and we have to face this. A minister whom I greatly respected and listened to him many times and got help from his ministry now he says there's no harm for Christians to go to gay weddings and sit listening to the wicked vows. Ungodly, unscriptural, unethical. There's nothing wrong with it, he said. It's okay now, these eco-friendly churches that are mushrooming all over the north of Ireland and other places, in civic centres, in houses and in halls, the CIE, the Church of the Itching Years. It's all right to tell their people to go to the supermarkets and shop on Sunday. God understands that you're busy all week and you haven't time. God does not understand. God does not give credence to breaking his commandments and his laws. And it's all right they're telling these churches, come out of them old fundamental places and get liberty and get freedom. It's the work of the devil. It's all right to sip a glass of wine. It's all right to say to live with a partner. It's all right to divorce if you want to divorce. They've debated there a week or so ago in the House of Lords legislation that can put you in jail for seven years if you give a track or try to witness or try to win a sodomite to the Lord. And how shocking. How shocking. I know I'm not preaching to this congregation tonight. I'm preaching to a wider, a wider congregation. I'm glad that th over a thousand people are listening to these meetings. This word needs to go out and I'm not doing it lightly. How shocking to think that before the end of the year we have a prime minister who cannot define what a woman is and won't. I tell you, judgment is upon the nation. The rise of George Galloway is another clear sign that God has withdrawn from the nation. George Gall Galloway is leading, the, he's infested with demons, by the way. He's demonic to the very core. He's a hater of Israel, a hater of God. Yet God might raise him up as he did Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar and others. He's leading a vanguard of four to five million Muslims who are going to march through England and are marching through England, taking over businesses, taking over hotels and restaurants, taking over churches, and probably before the end of the year will take over the government. God has withdrawn. And if ever we needed a move of God, the Holy Spirit, I tell you, we need it. We need it. So the first thing here is sexuality. Everything rude, everything nude, everything crude, sweeping like a tsunami over land and the daily papers and internet, television, everywhere you go, schools, colleges, everything you listen to. Fueled by phones, and mobile, internet, TikToks and WhatsApp. And God help us so much tough stuff. 
50%, and this is the, this is the official statistics, 50% of a rise in bestiality in Northern Ireland, in Britain. 50%. And I'm not going to explain what bestiality is. Our nations on Skid Row and most in the church don't care. That's all I can say. So the first one is sexuality. The second one is hypocrisy. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Now the word hypocrisy is a play actor. He makes out to be something that he's not. He plays a policeman. He's not a policeman. He's only playing the art of a policeman. He's an imposter. And he, he, he's tell, he, he, he pretends to be telling the truth when he's speaking lies. And so concealing and so convincing and so covering he is that I say again he'll deceive the very elect. Not one of the disciples, not one of the disciples thought it was Judas. In the upper room they said one to another, is it I, is it me, is it me? And there were three and a half years with them. You know, we're talking about the Antichrist. We deceive the whole world. So the first attack of the devil too was on the Garden of Eden. It was lies. And whenever, whenever the devil could nail Adam and Eve in the Garden with lies before the fall, before the fall of man, His demons and millions of emissaries and dark spirits are at work in the latter times in a big way. I don't have time to say anything more about that tonight. Number one, sexuality. Number two, hypocrisy, telling lies. Number three, brutality. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That word seared is the word cauterized. And the word is to be melted and marked and with, a, with a brand. The slaves in that day were stamped like cattle with red hot iron on their forehead with the master's brand on it. And this is what Paul's saying will be in the last days. They'll be bent and their conscience will be cauterized. They'll be dark. That's brut that brings, leads into, of course, nothing only brutality that you see today. I tell you, my friend, you that are not saved tonight in this meeting and are listening to me, you flee from the wrath to come. Flee to the arms of Christ tonight before you leave this Sanctuary, flee to Jesus tonight for, for if the Christ was to come now and he could come at any moment, let me tell you, you're going out to meet the Antichrist and you'll have the mark on your forehead or your right arm. And you'll do what he bids you to do. And there'll be no hope of your salvation. You'll be lost forever. How sad, how terrible. When you think of the nerve ends of a conscience being seared with a hot iron, silenced, all you have to do is think of the abortion. A couple of hundred thousand in Britain every year aborted. Now they're saying you can abort them up to the time of birth. When in many cases they abort the, the fetus six months and seven months, and even three months. And they, can, and they can show them wriggling in the womb with the knives cutting them. They cut them apart. They have to cut the head off to get them out of the womb. Talk about murder. Talk about genocide. They can talk all they like about genocide. They can talk all they like about the Holocaust. The more than millions and mil 40 million in, in, in Britain, across the world. Day after day, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of them are being, being murdered and butchered in their mother's womb 
And I read of a doctor the other day, he says, I'm proud to be an abortionist, and if that's a murder, I'm proud to be a murder. Where's that come from? It comes from a conscience that's seared. What about Hamas? On October the 7th, you don't hear about these things when they're marching about Gaza. What about Hamas? They took their babies from their mother's arms and put them into red-hot ovens and held the mothers to listen to them screaming as it, they burnt them to death. And they themselves laughed. It's only demonic powers can do that. There's an onslaught of demons across their land over the children. That's why we are having a school here. That's why we're getting on so well with it. That's why so many people are supporting it. Because they know that there's coming a day when your child will have to be taken out of that system. And we'll need to have something for them. And I've asked God to give me three years till I'm 80 and then he can take me. Until I see this up and running and I see flocks of children coming in here as we believe in the name, as the Lord has shown us. And I ask you today to get in behind it. See what you can do. Because we'll have to give an account for the children. We can't let this go on. Teachers who take a stand and get in the sack. I could go on with reams of stuff, but there's no value in doing that. Hamas, with their conscience seared with hot iron, putting men in cages and dousing them with petrol and running a streak of petrol along the ground and setting a match to it and laugh at them burning to death. My friend, when we open our heart, when we open our minds to the devil, anything can happen. And if you're tinkering with anything, you young people or anybody else with the UG board or the cult or tarot cards or that damnable Harry Potter stuff, you remember that most of those evil, wicked men started like that. Mussolini, Philpott, Haman, Herod, Hitler. If any one of us here tonight went to Vienna, Vienna, and went into the Hoburg, the Hofburg Library in Vienna, and asked the librarian to show us the spear that the Roman soldier used to gouge out the sight of Christ. They couldn't even leave him when he was dead. That's, that soldier gouged out the sight of Jesus, went up into his heart, and blood and water come out. And Campbell, and Martin Lloyd Jones, who was a specialist, said one day, cardium of the heart was ripped, there's water. The heart was ripped. They couldn't leave him when he was dead. Do you hear, sinner, tonight? He bore that sword for you, and he bore it for me. They reckon that they have that sword in the Hofburgs in Vienna. There's another sword. They're not sure which of them, but they're almost certain they have this one that they show people. That's, that, that's the sword the young Adolf Hitler went into. If you and I went in there tonight and we saw that sword and we're almost sure that was a sword, I don't care. I think the worst of us would bow our head and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bearing that for me. I tell you, if we could see that sword that he shrouded up into the Savior on the cross, I would say, just thank you, Lord. Adolf Hilper went in as a young man. He asked to see the sword. They took him to the sword. They say that he went into a trance. And I don't know, maybe a half an hour, I don't know how long, but a long time they say he gazed upon the sword and he prayed to the devil and he said to the devil devil you put the spirit into me the spirit that was in that soldier that guards Christ's heart I want that spirit and that spirit came into him and we know the results of it the results of it was that they used to pray when he was 
in control with his mighty charismatic ways and his mighty power that he could bend men and women and gather all sorts of people, hundreds of thousands around them. And they used to pay our father, which art in Nuremberg, praying to, to Hitler. It's no knowing, my friend, where it ends when the enemy gets in. We need to pray and we need to cry to God and we need to seek God. I want to go again here because it's not only sexuality and hypocrisy and brutality, but in verse 3 there's legality. And we're going to be over in good time tonight. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. That's a demonic doctrine, if ever there was a demonic doctrine. It's completely, totally against the Word of God. Completely, totally against the Word of God, my friend. Commanding to marry. It's a demonic doctrine. And thousands of children in Ireland and worldwide have suffered because of that with the prohibition and stipulation on the Church of Rome. Hebrews 13 says, Marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled and whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. One of the vows that the Roman Catholic priest has to take is any priest who does not obey celibacy, let him be accursed. We have seen the dangers, we have seen the awfulness, we have seen the aftermath of it. Again, against the children. And the half has not been told. That word forbidden is the word restrain, to hinder, to stop. And let me say it to you, the night is bad enough Society being against marriage and they are discouraging it in every hand, but the church in many places, the Christendom, partnerships better, they say. If you want to, if, if you want out of your marriage now, you can do it on the internet. If you snore for five minutes and you record it, if your shirt is not clean, there's all sorts of ways now we're getting out. It's so simple to do. It's the doctrine of devil. It's destroying marriages and destroying homes. And commanding to abstain from meat, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. Another doctrine of Rome. Another doctrine of the Muslims. Enforcing upon poor people that if they do without food, if they take a day without food and they afflict their body with penance, they'll get a place in glory or they'll get to heaven or they'll be a shorter purgatory. It's a lie from hell. It's a doctrine of demons. And Paul says there'll be much of it in the last days, the latter times, the days in which we're living. And oh, if I could open my heart fully to you tonight to warn men and women, to warn you young people, to warn you of the devil, of the demonic powers that are coming against us. And we're so blinded and so foolish and so stupid at times that we don't see it. We're more concerned in our houses and our cars. We're more concerned in our holidays. Be honest about it. Do we realize that any moment he could burst the clouds and come again? I was down preaching down there with Robert, brought me down today to the welcome hall. Do we realize how close the coming of the Lord is? That any moment now we, he'll wrap you the church and we'll go before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll give an account. You'll give an account for every penny that you robbed from the Lord. When you mass your money, let it be, let it be your old age pension. God expects his tithe. He expects your time. He expects your talents. Because we'll stand before the judgment seat and we'll give an account. There's a day of accountability coming soon, my friend. It's coming. It's coming very soon. 
And what will the, the value of these things be then? What will be the uses in the houses and the cars? What will be the uses in the money? There will be no value. Solomon could say at the end of the day, all things is vanity, 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 the richest man that ever lived. It's all vain. Only one life will soon be passed. And only what's done for Jesus will last. That's why I preach twice today. That's why I'll preach twice tomorrow if I, if I could get somewhere to preach. Preach the word. Tell people the word. Tell them that Jesus is coming. Tell them that he'll soon be here and we need to be ready. I told them down there in the welcome hall today that everyone, my friend, every one of the writers, the apostles, the Lord Jesus, Peter, Jude, John, all of them speaking about the Lord's return was mostly in their last words. They were Jesus' last words. They were Peter's last words. They were Paul's last words. And last words of a dying man need to be heeded, especially the apostles, especially men inspired by God. The last words. And everyone, every time you read about the second coming of the Lord, and you trace it up, I've done a study on it. You read and you trace where they're talking about the Lord appearing, the Lord coming, the Lord coming. He's soon coming. Watch, be ready when he comes. Every one of them is preceded by how we should live. Or if not preceded, it's followed by it. You find out how we should be living in these days when he's so near. Paul says we should be living holy, blameless lives before God and before man. And it says to, Paul says, to them that are without, that's the world. What does the world see you as? God knows the testament of the churches and tatters. How does the world see you tonight? How does the men that you work with, how does the people that you deal with, how do the people that you, that you go to school with, how do they see you tonight? To them that are without the world, the world needs to begin to see Christ. If really we saturated ourselves in that last verse, if really we realized that he was manifest in flesh, he was adored by the angels, he was preached unto to the Gentiles, he was received up into glory, and he's at the right hand of the Father tonight, the Prince and the Saviour coming again. And Paul's warning us there'll be a doctrine, doctrine of demons, the like of we have never seen. I expressly tell you, he says, I explicitly tell you, the latter times are going to be awful. Legality. Legality. And I want to close like this tonight. God help us. I wouldn't want to leave the message there. I wouldn't want to stop there. And thank God we don't have to stop there. Thank God we don't have to stop with the wart. I want to thank God tonight with all my heart that I'm not in bondage. I'm not fettered in legality. Now let me say something else, and neither is this church. These boys can go out and say it's a dinosaur church and it's full of legality and you have to do this and you have to do that. It's a lie of the devil. The doctrine of the devil. That's what it is. Anything we do in this church, we do it. And anything we have in our constitution, my friend, is because we love the Lord and we want to serve the Lord. And I'm glad to be called a dinosaur. I'm glad to be called an antique preacher. I'm glad of it. That's a great compliment. When I look around me and see the sort of stuff that's gone on, boys that are supposed to be in pulpits, that are supposed to be called, the only call they got was a phone call. Don't talk to me about legality. 
I am not bound, I am not fettered, I am not chained, nor is this church tonight. We are free. And we will remain free. And if to be bound in legality and to be bound in bondage is to preach the gospel in all its clarity and all its power, amen. If to be bound and to be in legality is to preach the blood and the second coming, tell me, when did you last hear it in your church? Eh? If to be bound is to be, it preach the atonement and substitution If that's bondage, I plead guilty to it. No, I'm not in bondage tonight. I thank God that 54 years ago, if I get to the end of May, hallelujah, glory to God, I was set gloriously free. Free from the low, happy condition, Jesus has died in there's remission. And I tell you this, I've been free ever since, since and he that the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm as free as a bird tonight. I'm not in bondage to drink. I'm not in bondage to dr drugs. I'm not in bondage to pornography. You're in bondage to pornography. You need to be set free. Because if you go on with that stuff, you'll get your conscience seared. You're in bondage to money tonight. Not in bondage to any of those things. You need to let those things go, my friend. You need to re man up. You're not even allowed to say that now. Man up. You have to say man and woman up. Well, I'll be saying man up. Thank God tonight that we're free. Isaiah 61, and I'm finished now in a minute. Jesus says of Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Hallelujah. Tell me, are you bound tonight? Be honest tonight. Are you bound by drugs? Are you bound with drink? Wherever you're listening to me tonight, are you bound? Are you fettered? Are you chained with the past, with fears of tomorrow? There's a saviour tonight. There's a deliverer tonight. There's the one who set the man from Gadara free. There's the one who set Stephen Riddle free. There's the one who set me free. He can set you free tonight. If you come, if you come as a sinner to Jesus, God hasn't given you the spirit of fear, dear. Some of you are sitting in you the spirit of fear. Oh, the life's scared out of you. The life's scared out of you about cancer. The life's scared out of you about their children. And what's going to happen? God has never given you a spirit of fear. That's a demonic, devilish spirit. He has given you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. The children will be all right. You just leave them in the hand of God and get into the prayer meeting for them. They'll be all right. Your health will be all right. And if you're struck with cancer, we'll put oil in you and pray and you'll be delivered like many others here. Hallelujah. Legality. I'm not bound tonight. I can eat what I like far too much at times. I can eat what I like. I can go where I like. I can do what I like. In the Spirit of the Lord, there's liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're back at the end of verse 16 of chapter 3. Oh, my dear friend, manifest in flesh, justified in the Spirit, adored by the angels, preached on to the Gentiles, believed up in the world and received, received, believed in the world and received up into glory. Hallelujah. He's in the glory tonight. Isn't Paul, isn't the Holy Spirit good that gives us that before he gives us the next thing? Isn't he good the way he deals with us and works with in our life? Isn't it good, my friend, when the trial comes, the blessing will come? Have you ever remarked as you're going down the road and there's trials and there's troubles and there's affliction and you're being hammered from one end to the other with the family, with the health, with the children? It'll not be very long until the blessing comes. He knows how to do it. And I trust tonight that we will keep our head up and lift up and look up for a Redeemer draws nigh. 
We're not going to be dictated by demons, by devils, by men, but by God alone. He is our God. He is our Savior. This God is our God, and he will be our guide, even unto death.